as in alternative spiritualities here, especially Hebrewism, but tonight doing something very different. Church history, Christian history, specifically the Reformation and how it relates to Eastern Orthodoxy. That is something you hardly ever hear anything about, Eastern Orthodox Church and the Reformation. And we're going to be talking about it tonight, Thursday, July 8th, 2021. It's 8.30. The Phoenix Suns are about to put the Milwaukee Bucks away in the finals, and that's why we started late, because I got caught up. Go Suns! And guess what? I'm a Protestant. I'm a Calvinist. I'm Reformed. I'm going to talk about this topic with a friend of mine who's a Roman Catholic. I did not realize, ladies and gentlemen, till just now, but today is Abu Kamar's birthday. Why are you letting me make you do a live stream on your birthday, Abu? Come on, man. Abu. Oh, Abu. Well, let me, uh, let me, let me, let me see. Uh, Abu, 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 you've, 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 you've muted yourself there, my friend. Yeah, I'm here, though. I'm here. Well, so what's up, bro? But un- can you unmute yourself? Yes, right. sir. So why are you doing this on your birthday? It, it, fa- the only thing I'll say is that uh, Facebook may not be telling the truth about my birthday. Oh! <laughs> so you may have some bad third-hand information that's derived from Facebook, but whatever the case. Sounds Whether like it's my birthday or not, I love the felicitations. But Sounds like a Hebrew Let's move on and talk about Kirillos Lucaris. Bad third-hand information off the internet. Yeah. <laughs> I had to put at least one in there. Okay, so say his Jesse, name, yep. same say his name, Abu Kamar, just like Destiny's Child so long ago. Say his name. Oh, I, I think uh, someone will say I'll get it wrong, but uh, Kirillos uh, uh, Lukaris. Uh, I say Lukaris, but I've had people correct me and say no, the emphasis on the first syllable, uh, Lukaris. But yeah, Cyril Lukaris is how people typically say it in English. Say it the way a, a white person will say it. Well, I, I, I just want to say, if we're going to do that, please don't call him Cyril. At the very least, call him Cyril. Don't call Kirillos Cyril. We can say do Cyril. Do not say Cyril, call him I'm going to be cringing every single time. All I did was tell Abu to say it like a white person, and he gets all upset. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, because I've been watching people If we're going to do you know? that, don't mispronounce it. Don't no, say Cyril. No, no, we Cyril. can say Cyril. Just don't say Cyril. His name was Kirillos. His mama called him... I don't know. I don't know what his mother called him, but Cyril? His, he was known as Kirillos. But yeah, in English, you know, the English equivalent is Cyril. But yeah, if I was I watching say, uh, some some of our Baptist friends who were covering this, and they were like Cyril, Cyril Lucaris, and I was like, mm-hmm. you got pretty upset about Cyril. that, huh? Well, since you mentioned it, let's introduce tonight's topic, Abu, by playing one of our Baptist friends. So okay. everyone, let me just look at me for a second. I'm a live streamer. Abu's a frequent guest. We're friends. We have differences, and tonight is going to be interesting because we're going to be discussing yet another aspect of Christendom, Eastern Orthodoxy. This is mainly going to do with history, but obviously theology is going to be in there. But what's interesting is this is not obviously a topic I tackle a lot, right? It's not like I've never looked at it or anything like that. And Abu doesn't claim to be an expert either, but he is the one who prodded me to look more into this. And I was very glad when I did this particular thing we're going to talk about. So what's going to happen for most of you who are not Orthodox and uh, and aren't aware of a lot of these things, this will be the first time you've ever heard about a lot of these issues. So just give it time. Take it slow. It's okay. Just it's all right. And so you're going to be kind of catching up with some of this stuff. But Most of you have some idea that there was a thing called a Protestant Reformation. Most of you have some idea. You think of the Roman Catholic Church as this sort of other side to the story there. But a lot of times people don't think or talk about, what about the churches of the East? Well, what was the interplay like there? Well, obviously wasn't as hot and heavy as it was in Rome or Wittenberg or wherever. But it wasn't as if it was non-existent. And so we're going to talk about an example of that tonight. And I thought it'd be fun to do it this way. By playing a clip of a Baptist pastor, I, I said Baptist just because I feel like some Catholics call all 
Christian Evangelicals Baptist. He's actually a Presbyterian brother. So I just said that. He's not actually a Baptist. I don't know why I said that. I'm just trying to segue. This is, uh, say what? No, I'm sorry. I was joking. You said he's a Presbyterian minister. And I'm like, right, Baptist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. See, there you go. <laughs> I think the Latin for Presbyterian is Baptist, but uh, I could be. I gotta look that one up. <laughs> right, right. So here is him talking when he first discovered Cyril. Just kidding, Cyril <laughs> Lucaris. So check out this clip. This is going to introduce it. Let's get into it, ladies and gentlemen. All right. So here's the brother right here. He did a 25 minute live stream and uh, he discussed a number of issues. But right about here, he started discussing the topic we're going to talk about tonight. So let me play it. What about Eastern Orthodoxy? What about uh, Roman Catholicism? I wanted to, to point out something. I haven't read this whole book yet, um, but what I have read in it is absolutely fascinating. It's called The Protestant Patriarch. Protestant Patriarch, The Life of Cyril Lucaris. Okay, Patriarch of Constantinople in the Eastern Orthodox religion. Okay, and his dates are... 1572 to 1638. So he's right on the, the heels of the Reformation. Okay. And eventually, to make a long story short, this guy eventually becomes a Calvinist. He becomes a reformed Christian while he's Patriarch of Constantinople. And he actually published a creed, um, a confession of faith. And chapter 13 of Cy I'm going to stop right there, Abu. So he did pronounce it the way you told everyone not to pronounce it, didn't he? Yeah, I, I, it was heartbreaking, but I'll get I'll I'll, I'll get past it. Now I, I I like this I like this guy. Okay, that's why I'm playing him. Uh, I I'm glad there is a, a gentleman who is diving into this issue. I'm glad that there is somebody who. Uh, I've heard that it. you've made a lot of new Orthodox friends. I don't know if your Orthodox friends are going to like your new Baptist friend, but we we hope there can be. Yeah, I, I, I have made a lot of new associates just from one single solitary Instagram post. I don't know what is happening. I got to look at how I tag that thing. <laughs> but nonetheless, nonetheless. The gram is the gateway to Antioch, man. I'm he, he brought up a good book. And remember that when I uh, messaged you this book and I said, hey, check out this book. It was because I saw it on his channel. So shout out to him. Credit to him. Mm. He's the one who introduced me to that book. And I looked it up. It can get pretty pricey, but you can get it for a little bit less because it's an academic book. I mean, obviously, the man is a reader. You look, look at the books he has in his office, right? With so a he, title as shocking as the title of this live stream, right? I believe the title is The Protestant Patriarch. Yeah, seriously. Like and when he yeah. said, um, you know, he had, he had read some of the book, but he hadn't finished yet. I thought, man, that sounds just like a Catholic guy with a Bible, you know? <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I know. <laughs> President company excluded, right? <laughs> excluded, right. Yeah. But no, what I... do you think about the way he introduces so far? So uh, he's he's saying, hey, this is – here he is on the heels of the Reformation, and you have Cyril now who comes out with a confession, and it's Calvinistic. Mm. Uh, what would you say to that introduction so far before he gets into one of the specific points there? Right. I would, I, I'd say that's accurate, and that's really – I think anyone, whether you're you know, Orthodox or Protestant or Catholic or not a Christian at all or you know, a Muslim, an atheist, whatever, if you have any interest in the subject and in the Reformation, I think they'll, you'll find this interesting. It is fascinating because a lot of times there isn't a lot of discussion about how the, the, the contact between Orthodoxy and the Reformation and how – Orthodoxy would respond to it. So I think a lot of people would be surprised to hear that a ecumenical patriarch, a patriarch of Constantinople, may have gone full Calvinist, you know, or at least Real had Calvinist quick, Real quick, the quick version, why is the patriarch of Constantinople important? Some people mean that that title sounds very foreign maybe to somebody. Why is that even important? Well, it's, 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 it's one of the major C's within Orthodoxy. I mean, now... Uh, I, I so don't want to say – Would we describe a C as, a, as, a, as, a, as an important uh, ecclesiastical jurisdiction rooted in yes. a certain city? Yes, yes, exactly. You know, it's a, a major, a major uh, episcopal office, you know, or at least historically. How, now, uh, would you say that Roman Catholics have a similar concept as far as a holy see, but they only have one? Yeah, precisely. Uh, although uh, – 
Well, see, the thing was Constantinople was part of the the, the Pentarchy, this idea of, you know, that there were five Mm -hmm. uh, major Episcopal sees, you know, that there was Rome, Alexandria, Antioch, Jerusalem, and Constantinople. So in that sense, it's historically significant. Uh, Every now and then you'll meet, I I believe the Orthodox balk at this, but every now and then you'll meet people who insinuate that the ecumenical patriarch, which is what the patriarch of Constantinople, Constantinople is called, is something akin to an Orthodox Pope. Now, I, I know that sends shivers down the spines of uh, uh, of our Orthodox friends, so I'm not endorsing that claim. Right. But in, whatever the case, it's a very significant bishopric within the the history of the Orthodox Church. So the Orthodox would view the, the Bishop of Rome, as they would call him, as having, you know, authority based on the tradition uh, there with the other four, but they would view him essentially as a renegade bishop. You know, he's trying to u- usurp yes. over and against the other cities and the people in charge. Now, everyone, we're talking about this to explain it. Um, I'm a Protestant. I don't uh, just uh, put my cards on the table. I don't think any of those concepts are biblical concepts at all. Right. Like, I understand they're historical concepts, but it's important to try to understand them, and there's always a lot to learn about that. Shout out to Mr. Phil Fox. He says, Abu is the man. Well, I appreciate and that. Thank says, you, Mr. Fox. <laughs> shout out to to Abu, the coolest voice on YouTube. I, I really appreciate that. Whoever said that? That's Mr. Phil Fox, them. and he told oh. me the sun's one. And then Scythe <laughs> says go. I should do a discussion with Jay Dyer. I I agree. I am. I don't know much about Jay Dyer, but I saw his debate with Shabar Ali, and I was very impressed. I think he's a very sharp. Uh, uh, Orthodox uh, apologist. He's a, a convert to Orthodoxy, if I'm not mistaken. I think you should do a discussion with Jay Dyer. <laughs> that's what I'd rather see than myself. I think that'd be more okay. interesting. But so, so now let's play this clip where he gets into the confession, and then I'll pause it again. Here we go. Lucaris, the, the patriarch of Constantinople, the head of the Eastern Orthodox Church, published a creed in 1629. Okay, let, let me, and before I read the, the article here, I want to read to the doctrinal, uh, the chapter of this confession that he wrote, this Orthodox prelate wrote. I wanted to uh, read to you um, an article. Let's see, a, a paragraph of an article. Yeah, I had it pulled up right here. Yeah, here we go. <clears throat> uh, let's see, where was the quotation? Yeah, here we go. In 1629, Cyril Lucaris, Patriarch of Constantinople, published his famous Confession of Orthodox Faith in Geneva. As far as possible, it accommodated the language and creeds of the Orthodox Church. It appeared in the same year, two Latin editions, four French and one German and one English. The publication of the Confession shocked many leaders in the Orthodox Church and stirred up a storm of controversy. In 18 articles, followed by four questions and their answers, Lucaris professed virtually all the major doctrines of Calvinism, predestination, justification by faith alone, acceptance of only two sacraments, rejection of icons, rejection of the infallibility of the church. Lucaris frankly embraced the doctrine of predestination. He asserted, quote, we believe that the most merciful God hath predestinated his elect unto glory before the beginning of the world without any respect unto their works and that there was no other impulsive cause to this election, but only the goodwill and mercy of God, end quote. Wow. You know why Lucaris did all this? Because he started reading his Bible. Abu Kamer. So, he is reading from an article describing some of the contents of the confession. And obviously, you can tell by the summary of the contents of this confession, this is not your father's Eastern Orthodoxy, right? Pun intended. Uh, now, Abu... Unmute yourself if you could, please. Of course, of course. And let's talk briefly maybe about, because it was so Calvinistic, you had a bunch of homies claiming he didn't even write it. Yes. Well, there's considerable controversy going on because it's not simply, unfortunately, unfortunately what's going on is not simply a conversation between the Orthodox and uh, Protestants. You know, there's, there's state powers involved there's the, the mm. question of, you know, Lucatus, even though he's the bishop of, uh, of Constantinople, he's living under Muslim rule, under the Ottoman Turks. And then, of course, there's, there's constant questions of uh, the Jesuits. You know, the Jesuits have, uh, are, are attempting to, you know, whatever. There's, there's, there's sort of counter, oh. from my perspective of Jesuit would be, a counter-Reformation 
specialist. Now, I'm not Precisely. saying that's all they are now. Then. Yeah, I, I'm talking about back then. They've branched out to 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 uh, becoming a bunch of liberals now. <laughs> Actually, they're still counter-reformation specialists. Just kidding. Just in a different way. No, but uh, that's how they began. And so the idea was they're not going to do all this priest stuff. They're going to do this study and stuff. That was their service to God. So they became mm. uh, a lot of times the most learned out of uh, – a, a, a group of people who are already, you know, pretty learned. Uh, no one should deny that about the Roman Catholic hierarchy and whatnot. But these are like specialists, man. And so they they also tended to not just have that extra level of knowledge. They tended to have that extra level of zeal. And a few of them could be effective in a, a – a few of them could have a large influence. You know what I'm saying? Uh, what would you – how would you want to talk about the Jesuits uh, historically well, at this so- time? So the question becomes uh, – what happens is that you get all these sort of accusations and counter accusations and there's questions about who's, whose hand is involved in what. So mm-hmm. for example, uh, one of the, th- uh, the claims that comes up is you know, maybe, maybe Lucatus didn't write this confession. I think it's you know, people who seriously look at the subject now understand that Lucatus wrote that confession. But whatever the case – uh, there have been people who have denied that he wrote the confession and some have insinuated it was merely the, you know, the Protestants who did that in, on his behalf. And, but some have even insinuated that, you know, that this somehow has its roots in Jesuit rumors or something like that, you know? Yeah, or so people so might – I've heard cold. people vaguely say his enemies, the, you know, they, they, they mm-hmm. did this. And, but the thing is uh, when I've looked into this, he affirmed – he – it gets a little complicated, but uh, it's like – he wouldn't deny it, and then I think he eventually affirmed it. And I think yeah, everything. Yeah, apparently is sh- he, he affirmed it in private correspondences, is what I've read. Yeah, yeah, and I think those private correspondences are sort of the nail in the coffin. No, I don't claim to be an expert in them, but when you end up looking at those back and forths, uh, I think it it kind of it kind of lets you know what's going on. And remember the lecture I sent you today from the Greek Orthodox perspective. He was saying, yeah, he was saying, you know, everybody didn't know that he had these leanings in the east, uh, but because of private correspondence, some of the some of the folks in the west did, and obviously mm. became more known once he published these confessions. Um, and so well, here too, there's the, the the thing about the struggle between the Jesuits and the Reformation also has relevance because apparently Lucadius, like many uh, within the Greek Orthodox Church, were skeptical at best and ho- outright hostile to, at worst, the, the Jesuits. And so, you know, there's not discussing this particular subject, but uh, the Greek Orthodox scholar Johannes Romanides has, has talked about how uh, many Orthodox, when they would try to battle with Rome, they would reach for Protestant weapons. And when they would, you know, battle with Protestants, they would reach for Roman weapons. So this may be a case of, of a man, you know, uh, being excited about this very uh, energetic and very intellectual challenge to, to, to Rome that's posed by the Reformation. And so, you know, he somewhat uh, involved himself with it, and uh, it seems he was converted by it. You know, he wasn't merely borrowing from it. Uh, he was absorbed by it. That's Yeah, I mean, a- the, the quotes I've seen from him about this seem to indicate that uh, I, I studied Scripture and came to these conclusions that, you know, the, there, this is right. And and uh, that's that's what the quotes I've seen from him on a, about where this came from, and the Presbyterian minister, you know, he may not put it in a way people like, but that's basically what he says. Let me continue with this clip. You start reading the Bible. When you read the Bible, you tend to move in that direction. Listen, what, listen, what this article goes on to say. But Lucaris stressed the importance of works, not as the basis for the salvation of man, but as proof and fruit thereof. Yep, when you read the Bible, you will get it right. Okay, works are not the cause of salvation. They are simply the fruit and evidence thereof. And Cyril Lucaris, in the early 17th century, reading his Bible, figured that out. And in his correspondence with Geneva and the Reformed theologians um, on the in uh, Europe, he understood the Christian faith. And he tried to codify that into a confession. Listen to this. <clears throat> Chapter 13 of Cyril Lucaris, Patriarch of Constantinople, of his confession, quote. So now he's going to actually quote from it. Abu, anything else either you see from the live chat or uh, based on what the Presbyterian pastor has said so far? Um, Not yet. No, it's, uh, let's keep it going. And definitely, uh, aside from what he reads, I think uh, you should also maybe read some of your favorite passages from the confession. 
Oh yeah, I, oh, I, I, I got. I, there's some we went over before we started. I, there's lots of favorite passages from the confession, so I will. I just thought it was interesting. This is one of the few videos I found where a Protestant was talking about this, and so I wanted to I wanted to play it and also give. Yeah, because people know about this. That's that's yeah. what's why it's worth discussing. I mean, we teased the pronunciation, but hey, brother, I, I don't really know. Abu's the linguist guy, you know. I mean, we we he didn't know what you were gonna say, uh, so but we know it's uh, <laughs> closer to Cyril. All right, here we go. We believe that man is justified by faith and not by works. But when we say by faith, we understand the correlative or object of faith, which is the righteousness of Christ, which, as if by hand, faith apprehends and applies unto us for our salvation. This we say without any prejudice to good works. For truth itself teaches us that works must not be neglected, that they are necessary means to testify to our faith and confirm our calling but that works are sufficient for our salvation, that they can enable one to appear before the tribunal of Christ, and that of their own merit they can confer salvation. Human frailty witnesses to be false. But the righteousness of Christ being applied to the penitent alone justifies and saves the faithful. Wow. Why did he get this right? He, he cracked open his Bible. He started reading it. And he started corresponding with good theologians. The Protestant Patriarch is the book. I really need to finish that book. What I have, uh, Abu. All right, you want to talk a little bit about that? Which that was uh, was that decree two or what was that chapter two? What was thirteen? I think he was reading. It could be two. Two is um, uh, two is about sola scriptura, and uh, 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 thirteen is is about justification by faith, if I recall correctly. Yeah, yeah. And I believe okay. he was reading from thirteen. Oh, okay, I had the wrong thing up. I had the response up. Oops, no wonder I was confused. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> the response like, can get a little confusing there. It's uh, yeah. And the, I'm going to go ahead and say that it might not uh, endorse justification. By yeah, it. it's the opposite. So, <laughs> so yeah, chapter thirteen. We believe that man is justified by worth and not by faith. She's. We believe that man is justified by faith and not by works. When we say faith, we understand the correlative or object of faith, which is the righteousness of Christ, which is, which as if by hand, faith apprehends and applies unto us for our salvation. This we say without any prejudice to good works, for truth itself teaches us that works must not be neglected, but they are a necessary means to testify to our faith and confirm our calling. But that works are sufficient for our salvation, that they can enable one to appear before the tribunal of Christ, and that of their own merit they can confer salvation human frailty witnesses to be false but the righteousness of christ being applied to the penitent alone justifies and saves the faithful now just even this last thing where he said this now i know this is an english translation obviously okay we we understand that uh, we're reading a english translation i believe the translator is dennis bratcher i believe that's who it is and we'll give a link for this later but that right there the righteousness of Christ being applied to the penitent, I mean, that sounds like imputation even. So imputation became a really hot topic within seminaries when I was in seminary. Uh, and what happened is because of some stuff with mainly N.T. Wright, the, some of the stuff he popularized with a new perspective on Paul, he wasn't the first one to have that. And there's multiple perspectives within the perspective, obviously. But uh, some of it has to do with justification. And uh, part of it ended up being this debate about imputation. And in general, when it came to justification, those who advocated a version of the new perspective on Paul would deny that imputation was part of uh, of justification. They, they, they debated and said, no, nah, nah, that ain't really right. And so because of that, they said some of the Reformation could have been avoided because there was simply a misunderstanding. And then uh, not only, but John Piper was a popular ex example of someone who wrote on this and focused on it. Uh, D.A. Carson did more scholarly work with it, saying, no, 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 th this really is the case. The imputation is necessary. Let's look at this. And I think uh, um, some, there's a number of other names involved. But and the idea of imputation is that Christ's right, Christ righteousness is given or uh, credited to us. And in general, the East doesn't like that kind of um, debt payment language in regards to atonement and in regards to what happened at the cross and all that. Uh, but there's biblical reasons for why we say no imputation is a biblical concept. Uh, you know, then uh, there's lots of places that people go and, and have that discussion. But I mean, it really sounds like that's even imputation, the righteousness of Christ being applied to the penitent. That's not, I, I don't think that's something you could say if you held to Trent. What do you think, Abu? 
But it does sound like something a reformer would say. What do you think? What's your perspective, bro? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, I guess. I mean, I don't know. I, it's, uh, uh, I don't have a lot of commentary on that. Uh, well, what about this paragraph in general? I mean, if I didn't, if you didn't know where this came from, and I said, "Here's the date of this," wouldn't you think this is a reformer? Oh, of course, of course. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. And and there's so many paragraphs within his confession that are definitely like that. Yes, unequivocally. And yes. we have to remind everyone who is this person writing this again, Abu? Please remind everyone who's writing the Bishop this. Bishop of Constantinople, the Ecumenical Patriarch of Constantinople, is one of the most significant, uh, you know, Episcopal sees within the Eastern Orthodox Church. So and, it's, it's, and that's interesting because I think there is, uh, you know, this uh, there is a belief that. So let me let me if I could give just a slight historical background uh, in the previous century. This is taking place in the 17th century, which is to say the 1600s. In the previous century, there were some Lutheran scholars who uh, translated the Augsburg Confession into Greek and sent it to a previous patriarch. Yeah, and, and you, you've been we've been uh, we. Um... Well, anyways, in that lecture I sent you, I don't know if you he, he made like a really mm -hmm. big deal out of the of the, the of the Greek mm -hmm. translation of the Augsburg Confession. Like that was a very important part. To, it, it felt like his lecture, uh, and I and I, at first I was like, I'm surprised he's spending so much time on that. But it's, apparently it's very important. Go ahead. Sorry about that. So no, I'm glad you brought up that lecture because he says something in passing. That's uh, Father Panayotis. Uh, he says something in passing that I've heard other Orthodox say that when the Patriarch of, of Constantinople, a previous Patriarch, uh, Yeremias uh, II, I believe his name was, uh, when he saw this Greek translation of the Augsburg, uh, Aug Augsburg Confession, it was uh, the way the, the gentleman you mentioned uh, described it. He said it was it was somewhat embarrassing. And I've heard other Orthodox say this, that you know when knowledgeable Orthodox come into contact with uh, you know, Protestant theology, Reformed theology, it's on a certain level, it's it's embarrassing, right? This is a, a, a refrain I've heard. And so the implication is that, you know, whenever Protestants have come into contact with the Orthodox world, they're only grabbing the ignorant. And therefore, that's why it's also significant. The reason why I went on the segue is because surely the patriarch of Constantinople was not among the ignorant. You know, this right. isn't somebody's grandmother on a farm or something like that. You know, this is... And that's why, you know, that's their, their my, significance. My, my grandmother was raised on a farm, by the way. <laughs> what was her position on justification? Uh, uh, yeah. My, on my dad's side, my grandmother was raised on a farm. She was the youngest of a bunch of brothers, and they would always tease her because she was the only girl, and she had a heck of a time growing up. And so she learned to not express her feelings very fast. So she was a different kind of grandma. You're not going to get a lot mm. of lovey-dovey and all that because she was used to be the – and she grew up on a little rural farm in Ohio and was not raised as a Christian or a Catholic, just kind of an American, if you want to say. And when mm -hmm. she went into the service, she joined something that they had at the time that was a female branch of the Navy called the Waves, and she was saved uh, around that time. And her position on justification would have looked very close to a Methodist. Which is not exactly reformed, but anyways. <laughs> okay, so just so everyone knows, uh, we didn't – I don't know if we explained it. Well, we didn't. We just transitioned to talking about the Augsburg Confession. That is not Cyril's confession. We're talking about Cyril's confession, but just so everyone understands, now we're talking about the dialogue back and forth basically – between uh, some of the reformers, specifically their Lutheran theologians with the Augsburg Confession, and the East, because as they translate it in Greek, that's when the Greeks get a hold of it, and that's why we were talking. That's why it was relevant, mm -hmm. uh, and I also because there was this previous attempt to reach out to, you know, to a patriarch in, in Constantinople, and it was it was less successful. But then, you know, uh, less than a century they, later, yeah, they were rebuffed. He was he was kind of nice at first when he got these letters from these Lutherans. And then he basically, by the second or third time, was like, okay, leave me alone. Stop talking about this. And they still sent another letter after that. <laughs> like, you know, listen to us, man. Come on, man. But, uh, <laughs> or, I mean, anyways. Okay, so back to, back to the confession from the Orthodox Patriarch of Constantinople. And, and there's only a few more minutes, but I do want to finish playing this clip from the Presbyterian minister as he talks about it. But it is absolutely fascinating. Fascinating person. Now, so Cyril, Cyril Lucaris, Patriarch of Constantinople in the Eastern Orthodox faith, he publishes this creed, uh, 
defending biblical truth. And later, the Eastern Orthodox religion convoked uh, a, a, a council, a synod of Eastern Orthodox churches was called in Jerusalem in 1672 to refute the position of Cyril Lucaris, Patriarch of Constantinople, who had published a confession in which he attempted to express Orthodox beliefs in terms of the predestination beliefs of Calvinism. I actually want to read that part real quick. So I feel bad because I'm leaving his face on here. That's why I'm covering his face uh, as I read, just because I feel bad. Uh, no one likes to have a freeze frame on their face. Could I read Abu from uh, Chapter 3, which got me um, excited before Please. the show? Please do. So this is an Eastern Orthodox at the time, patriarch, specifically of Constantinople. And listen to what he wrote, re listen to what he wrote in his confession. This is Chapter 3. Okay, ready? We, we believe that the most merciful God has predestined his elect unto glory before the beginning of the world without any respect to their works and that there was no other impulsive cause to this election. That literally is unconditional election, ladies and gentlemen. If you talk about the, the U in TULIP in regards you know, to the English acronym, it's unconditional election. But where does it come from? You know, Ephesians 1 would be a great place to have a discussion about this. But uh, listen to this. But only the goodwill and mercy of God, in like manner, before the world was made, he rejected him whom he would. So uh, that gets into the doctrine of reprobation and sometimes even double predestination. He rejected whom he would, of which act of reprobation. If you consider the absolute dealing of God, his will is the cause. So he's saying that uh, God is in charge of salvation like everything else, basically. This is how I would interpret a book and bring his comments as a discussion between us. But if you look upon the laws and principles of good order, which God's providence is making use of in the government of the world, his justice is the cause. For God is merciful and just. And I would go to like uh, Romans 9 through 11 to, to, to have that part of the discussion there. Abu, because, uh, you know, he just mentioned the predestination. And now we're going to get into the refutation. But do you want to comment on any of that, brother? Because uh, no, no, I think it's now is an appropriate time to get to the to the to the response of the Jerusalem Synod. And, and the reason why the Jerusalem Synod is, is significant also is because something I found, I've, I've had this conversation with you and and other Protestants who are interested in orthodoxy. They'll say, you know. I talk with different Orthodox and I'm not sure what they believe. You know, like you could talk to, you know, one person who's Greek Orthodox and they'll tell you one thing and then you'll meet another guy who, let's say, he's a former Reformed person who's gone Orthodox and he'll tell you something different. And there's a certain uncertainty. So it's, it begs the question of like, well, is there anything even remotely close to an official Orthodox position uh, on topics that are of interest to, to Reformed folks? And the closest thing that I can think of is this document that was produced by the, uh, the, the Synod of Jerusalem in 1672, which was this, this other confession of uh, the Patriarch of Jerusalem uh, called uh, Dosethios. And, uh, which, um, so check this out. What Abu was saying, I think, and we're going to reiterate this. Rome is, uh, you know, a, a church in the West— and is more willing and ready to put things into writing. You know, here's what we believe, here's what we don't believe. And the reformers were all about that. You know, confession after confession, catechism after catechism. Now, the Orthodox Church calls itself the Church of the Seven Councils. So it's not that they don't affirm, because they do, uh, the creeds that came out of those councils. In fact, it seems that they think you shouldn't alter them, and that's part of the debate with the Fallocate Clause and all that. But check this out. At the same time, the churches of the East, we'll call it Eastern Orthodoxy here, that's a little more specific, are reticent to be too categorical and to find things too precisely in general. It's not that they don't do theology, I'm not saying that. But because there's an uh, acceptance, and some may say an over-reliance on mystery and the mystical, there's less willingness to sound like a lawyer or embrace the scholastic tradition, for example. I'm trying to be bouncing high, you know, talk about this as much as I can, and Abu can comment. So we have Council of Trent, 
And it basically is Rome doubling down on their response to the Reformation. If you believe the, these solas, anathema. You know, that's the short version of the, of the Council of Trent, right? And all those things we said before, yes, plus and then some. Take that, how you like them apples, right? The East doesn't really got this going on. But when they respond, because they, they have to respond... Yeah, it's almost as if their hand is forced. Yeah, to one of these, they've got to. And it's like a miniature version of the Council of Trent as far as the document that comes out of it. Now, you want to give your perspective or comment before we get into this response, which is the Council of Jerusalem? Well, I mean, if you want to play a bit more of the gentleman, uh, yeah, I certainly have a, a tiny bit to say on it. But we can, you know, if you want to finish out the video. Yeah, I will. It's not, it's not too much love. Here we go. <laughs> So here, here's the, here are the decrees of Eastern Orthodoxy. Listen carefully to this. If you're wondering, you know, what is, is Eastern Orthodoxy? Orthodoxy or, you know, can there, is there a way to understand them as being uh, true to the biblical faith? No, there's not. Listen to decree number 13. We believe a man to be not simply justified through faith alone, but through faith with, which works through love. That is to say, through faith and works. Paul says it's by faith, not by works. They say faith and works. Paul says it's by faith apart from works. And they say faith and works. So, and of course, it contains all the necessary affirmations of grace. Great. You couldn't do it without grace. Couldn't do it without grace. But man's works are what justify him before God. And so there you have orthodoxy. So what about this uh, Baptist minister in Belarus? Uh, all right, that's, that's actually the end. So I'm going to switch over to our screen now. And that gives us an end to talk about specifically that that right there because that's a direct response to what we read earlier from Cyril and uh, I'm going to read the full thing here Abu and then you tell me if there's anything different than what a good Roman Catholic could say in this we believe a man to be not simply justified through faith alone but through faith which works through love that is to say through faith and works but the idea that faith can fulfill the function of a hand that lays hold on the righteousness which is in Christ and can then apply it unto us for salvation, we know to be far from all orthodoxy. For faith so understood would be possible in all, and so none could miss salvation, which is obviously false. But on the contrary, we rather believe that it is not the correlative of faith, but the faith which is in us justifies through works with Christ. But we regard works not as witnesses certifying our calling, but as being fruits in themselves through which faith becomes efficacious and as in themselves meriting through the divine promises that each of the faithful may receive what is done through his own body, whether it be good or bad. Abu, comment. Abu, you got to unmute Yeah, no, yourself. I'm here. I'm here. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, at least uh, uh, certainly Catholics in at that time in the 17th century would have found uh, quite a bit to agree there. And uh, that's actually part of the accusations that have come up. Um, you know, just as some Orthodox have seen a Jesuit hand here and there, uh, when the Synod of Jerusalem Did and other... Did you say a uh, Jesuit hand? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, some of the, uh, you know, uh, Protestants who are familiar with the subject, uh, not only in the 17th century, but, you know, also the 18th and 19th centuries who have written on this, uh, they see like Jesuit influence here as well. That you know, as Lucatus goes too far towards you know uh, the Reformation, some felt then the the Orthodox response sort of fell into the hands of the Jesuits and and you know adopted quite a bit from them. So there is going to be this uh, similarity. It, you know, at least that's the explanation some Protestants gave for why the language is so similar to positions taken by Rome. <laughs> Well, but and isn't it, it? But to me, Abu. It, so there. So I remember one time we talked about this, and you said uh, there's. It's possible uh, Jesuit scholars uh, were helping of, them. Yeah, possibly. Yeah, yeah, they were sort of their phone a friend, right? Mm -hmm. It's possible on points um, of common agreement. Yeah, to, but <laughs> honestly, this, uh, this patristic source consider this, consider that. You know. But honestly, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like this would have been different from what they believed. Um, you know, I don't think they're writing it uh, sort of like, well, just to, it's like they're writing this because this is what they believe. I mean, how is this how is this different from, from the modern Orthodox position? Is it? 
which I know that no, gets I tricky, don't, I don't right? Think it is. Yeah, I don't. I mean, of course, I, it's 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 not my place to say for certain. Obviously, you would have to have on some you know orthodox apologist to say for certain. But no, I don't. I don't. I don't think there's going to be too many orthodox who are going to disagree with that. Uh, uh, but I think some Protestants, you know, including reformers who were, you know, there, there were quite a few correspondences, not only between Lutherans and various Orthodox, but also uh, Anglicans and so on. And there was this belief that the Orthodox Church uh, was more pure than Rome and, you know, would lean towards the Reformation. There was, there were right. many who believed that. And I think that's why some concluded that, you know, the Jesuits sort of tipped the balance. Like maybe these ideas were floating around, but, you know, the Orthodox weren't, you know, uh, it, it wasn't ossified like that. You know, that was the, the – and so hence this accusation that floated around, you know. The, the well, some people may uh, think the Presbyterian pastor came on too strong, but look, so for me, this is just me talking, not, not a boo, obviously. If you believe and affirm that faith alone is a biblical concept – I believe it wholeheartedly is a biblical concept. And then you read this, you realize as far as this goes, this, this Council of Jerusalem in 1672 from the Eastern Orthodox directly denies faith alone. And you just need to understand that. It's, it's, I think it's mistaken for some Protestants to kind of view Eastern Orthodox Church, because I think it's more of a variable in the sense of it's an unknown quantity to more of us in the West, especially, to think of the EOC as a halfway or something like that, halfway point to Rome or something like that. Uh, as far as justification goes, you're getting the same thing, it seems like to me. And I think that's important for people to understand. And, and just listen, this is it's pretty strong language. Let me reiterate this. We believe a man to be not simplified, justified through faith alone, but through faith which works through love. Now, we wouldn't say that we a prophet would agree faith does work through love, but that's not part of your justification. That's why Christ said it's finished. That is to say, through faith it works. It literally says, if you take out these parts in the middle and just get the basic of the clause, it's saying, we believe a man is justified through faith and works. That's the essence of the sentence. But the idea that faith can fulfill the function of the hand that lays hold on the righteousness which is in Christ and then apply it to us for our salvation. Remember I brought out how that one part of uh, Cyril really sounded like imputation, which is we are given the righteousness of Christ. We are, it is given to us. It sounded like that. That's because it was. This is directly denying that, as if faith is – because faith is viewed in the Protestant understanding of justification as being instrumental. So there's an instrumentality to it. And so we have this empty hand of faith, so to speak. But that is what God uses to give the righteousness of Christ to us on our behalf. And so you could say we're saved by works. We're saved through Christ's works. You see what I'm saying? If you wanted to put it that way, the righteousness which is in Christ and then apply it to us for salvation. I would say the Bible says that. I can get in some passages later, but I wanted to bring this up, what it says. It's very strong language. We know to be far from all orthodoxy. They're saying that is far away. This, this idea that Christ gave us his righteousness, this idea that it's, we're saved through faith alone, that is far from orthodox faith. With a capital O. Now, I don't understand this. This seems like a straw man in here, Abu. Maybe you can help me out. For faith so understood would be possible in all, and so none could miss salvation, which is obviously false. Are they saying that then just people would, anyone who believes anything, God would just give them God's righteousness? What are they, I, I was a little confused on that part. It seemed like a straw man to me. Did you understand that part? Abu, do you have it up? Yeah, okay. no, I'm here. I, uh, I, I, I need to read it over myself. Well, you sure. got it in front of you. I mean, you're the one who sent me the yeah, link. Yeah, that's exactly what I was doing. I was uh, decree thirteen. Stop, stop yeah. being distracted by the live chat. <laughs> okay, but on the contrary, we rather believe that it is not the correlative of faith. Notice how, at least in English translation, it's the same word that Cyril had used, right? 
But the faith which is in us justifies through works with Christ. But we regard works not as witnesses certifying our calling, which is the way we would talk about it, but as being fruits in themselves through which faith becomes efficacious and as in themselves meriting. And that's a big thing because, uh, you know, the idea that we in ourselves have some merit through work. No, no, through the divine promises that each of the faithful may receive what is done through his own body, whether it be good or bad. Um, but Abu, uh, okay, so now what we've done so far, Abu, is I think laid out the issues, and I think we'll, we'll do a little review for, for those who are coming in. But what we've done is we've given a, a, given a sample of the confession and a sample of the response. So Cyril, who we're basically saying, is a Calvinist patriarch of Constantinople, gave his confession, and then this Orthodox con uh, council in Jerusalem, 1672, gave these responses, which his were called chapters, theirs are called decrees. And now you've seen a taste of them. Now let's get into the, some of the minutia after we do a review. So review, and then Abu, I know there's some kind of detailed issues you want to discuss, and I want to make sure you can discuss those, okay? Uh, some of the more detailed issues. Okay, so... Within Eastern Orthodoxy, uh, Constantinople is a big deal. You know, uh, Constantine went into what is now modern-day Turkey and named the city after himself, Constantinople, and said, hey, this is the new or second Rome, right? And then after that, it was a, a seat of obviously imperial power, and ecclesiastical power um, was there as well. And so whoever was in charge of the church there was called the patriarch, and he became very important, especially as things went on. And there were other four other cities that were viewed as important. And um, then there was a split, the Great Schism of 1054. And so uh, the way the East would see it is Rome took herself out or, or left the, the, the proper body, you know. Uh, but that was, that was something that happened. And so now what we've got going on, is we have a situation where we're on the heels of the Reformation, and it hasn't affected the East as much, obviously, but it did affect the West more so. But now we have this patriarch of Constantinople who is coming and saying, here's what I believe, and it sounds like he's a Calvinist. And so they can't have that, and so the East responds, and it sounds very similar to the Council of Trent. So that's a review so far. And the reason why it matters is because you get a codification of Eastern Orthodoxy beliefs, which you don't very much get. And you get evidence that someone can be in this position because he was a very learned man. We didn't really talk about his bio. But if you but if you look at it, a very learned man, uh, we have somebody who is not, you know, an ignorant. Da, 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 da. You have someone who's convinced that this is a scriptural teaching when he writes this. OK, Abu. Review for everybody coming in, and then let us do some detailed work. Well, no, I think you pretty much covered it there. I mean, you have a, a situation where it seems there's good grounds to think that the, uh, the the bishop, the patriarch of one of the four major sees that remained with the Orthodox Church, you know, four remaining uh, bishoprics of the Pentarchy, has uh, gone Calvinist in the in the 17th century, in the early 17th century, and. Then you get this uh, response from uh, the Synod of Jerusalem, and it's a point-for-point -point response. So there were 18 points in the Confession of, of uh, uh, Kirillos uh, uh, Lucaris, and then there was 18 points plus a few questions in the uh, document that's produced by the Synod of Jerusalem, which is apparently is recapitulating a, a confession by a patriarch of Jerusalem called the Docetheus. All right, and now. Sometimes it gets really, the language gets really interesting. We've discussed a little bit about predestination in there. We discussed a little bit about justification. What else do you think we should discuss in their icons? Uh, the 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 supper, for example. What 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 are some of the other things you'd like to bring out? The canon of scripture is interesting. Uh, the, okay. Well, for example, you've been reading that's, that's chapter two, correct? 
I believe so. Let me uh, wait. No, hold on. That's more of a solo scriptura affirmation. I don't think it's yeah, the canon. Yeah, it's oh, could I read his solo scriptura while you look for the the canon yeah, one? Do. So this is chapter two. Your mic got worse, by the way, but it's all right. We can deal with it. We believe the Holy Scripture to be given by God to have no other author but the Holy Spirit. This we ought undoubtedly to believe, for it is written. We have a more sure word of prophecy to which you do well to take heed as to light shining in a dark place. We believe the authority of the Holy Scripture to be above the authority of the church, to be taught by the Holy Spirit, to be taught by the Holy Spirit. Uh, let me temporarily uh, mute you there, brother. To be taught by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> is a far different thing from being taught by a man. For man may, through ignorance, err, deceive, and be deceived. But the word of God neither deceives nor is deceived, nor can err, and is infallible, and has eternal authority. Now, first of all, what he's saying there is bathed in Scripture. He's using even some Scripture phrases. But it sounds like something Luther could have said. You know, this sounds like something Martin Luther himself could have said on this topic. Uh, Abu, uh, I just read chapter 2, which I called his Sola Scriptura part, is at least what I was calling it. But now, what would you like to do as far as... Um, well, know, for me, two, uh, it's, uh, two things that we had discussed, because since we were mentioning on the show how the, the language seems to lean towards uh, something that's, that's, that's a, a bit uh, Roman... What stands out for me, and we had discussed this in private in the lead up to the show, is uh, there seems to be an endorsement of transubstantiation. Like one thing that that some may experience with um, the Orthodox is that they will say that, of course, they believe that the bread and wine that that's given in communion, the bread is literally the body of Christ. They take that very seriously. But yeah, they'll say they it, will, it, they'll sometimes say. It. Maybe they'll say there's there's some word they use. I, they'll sometimes they'll say it changes or it is it, but they don't define it any further. They don't talk about it any further. Like they don't talk about the how. For example, which Aquinas was willing to talk about the how. For example, <laughs> which which uh, chapter was that though? Because you switched from talking about the canon to transubstantiation. Where was that in there? Can we go to that spot? The the seventeenth chapter. The seventeenth chapter. Okay. Uh, we so th th this is the response to Cyril, everybody. This is the response to the Council of Jerusalem. So this is the Eastern Orthodox position in writing, in essence, right? And it says this. We believe that the other sacrament which was ordained by the Lord is that which we call <clears throat> Eucharist. For in the night in which the Lord offered up himself, he took bread and blessed it, and he said to the apostles, Take, ye, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken the cup, he gave thanks and said, Drink all of this, this is my blood, which was said for many, this do in remembrance of me. And Paul adds, For as often as ye shall eat of this bread and drink of this cup, ye do show the Lord's death. This is the most, this is the pure and lawful institution of this wonderful sacrament, and the administration of which we profess the true and certain presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, that presence, however, which faith offers to us, not that which the devised doctrine of transubstantiation teaches. So they're almost like seem to be saying like, this ain't no transubstantiation, people. But but hold on, but wait, wait, hold on. That's, that's, what they're, that's what they're saying, it seems like. But let's see. For we believe that the faithful eat the body of Christ in the supper of the Lord, not by breaking it with the teeth of the body, but by perceiving it with the sense and feeling of the soul, since the body of Christ is not that which is visible in the sacrament, but that which faith spiritually apprehends and offers to us. From whence it is true that if we believe, we do eat and partake. If we do not believe, we are destitute of all the fruit of it. We believe, consequently, that to drink the cup in the sacrament is to be partaker of the true blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the same manner as we affirmed of the body for as the author of it commanded concerning his body so he did concerning his blood which commandment ought neither to be disremembered nor maimed according to the fancy of man's arbitrament uh, I'm not sure how you pronounce that word, but I love that word because I, I see what it means. But anyways, this is arbitrary choice. Yea, rather the institution <clears throat> ought to be kept as it was delivered to us. When therefore we have been partakers of the body and blood of Christ worthily and have communicated entirely, we acknowledge ourselves to be reconciled, united to our head of the same body, with certain hope to be co-heirs in the kingdom of come. Shout out to Rabbi Eduardo. says, I appreciate your ministry. Love the urban apologetics. Your ministry is very necessary. Thank you, brother. I appreciate the super chat. So, Abu, I read it there. It sounds like they're saying, this ain't no transubstantiation, folks. And then it sounds like they described something that sounds just like transubstantiation. But help me out. 
Well, well, yes, and in, in, in beyond that, they even introduced this. They're not. I don't think the Senate is the first to use this, but apparently, it was at the time a relatively recent uh, neologism. They introduced this Greek word, uh, uh, metusios, which what is you're basically saying is a new word to describe communion or to describe the process like how, how yeah so it's basically uh, so so methusios if you, I, if i understand this correctly if we think of like meta as the greek meta uh, as sort of corresponding to the latin trans as this idea of moving from one mm-hmm. position to another and then usios uh corresponding to substantia it's basically like almost an exact translation of the phrase excuse me of the of the term uh transubstantiation but it's just the, the greek term you know, I'll put it in the uh, the live chat if anyone wants to see it. Now, since you said trans, I can't help but play the sound. <laughs> Did you hear that? I, I got nervous there. Okay. Yeah, good. yeah, yeah, yeah. I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. Whenever you're. By the trans, way, is my mic better? Forgive me. I think. Okay. I see you just dropped the Greek in the live chat there. Yes. Yeah. Just so for anyone who's interested in the term, because it's an interesting term, and uh, now. My understanding is the the term did not originate with uh, either Docetius or this um, this council, but it was relatively new at the time. So it's sort of like a Greek neologism. That's if I'm not mistaken. That's my understanding, and it does translate to basically transubstantiation. And so that's fascinating that they adopt that term. What what, what do you think uh, the the Greek version was to affirming transubstantiation? Because for a Protestant, we would say. That ain't biblical, right? You know, that's a simple version. But they're not saying that. It seems like they're saying we don't want to really describe it in too much detail. Yeah, it takes that their bone goes too far in trying to describe the mechanics of it, quote unquote mechanics of it, you know. And uh, so they Jane would just Norm, leave it as a mystery. Jane Norm says now now Abu had said it wasn't new. He said it was relatively new, but uh he says it's not a new word, it's a word used in ecumenical council. But I stand corrected. If that's the case, I'd be I'd be curious if uh, if uh, I'm, I'm happy to stand corrected. Uh, I'd be curious uh, which council. And I don't mean that as like a challenge. Like I don't believe you. I'm, yeah, because uh, an ecumenical it. council is not very descriptive. Because if it's one relatively within the time frame, then it could still be described as a neologism. But either way, it seems to roughly correlate to transubstantiation. No, it certainly does. Yes, it certainly does. It certainly does, and uh, it, and that's interesting. Also, uh, aside from that, the eighteenth point I've seen, uh, you know, like uh, these these gentlemen who translated a lot of the uh, patristic writings. I think it's like Philip Schaff and Wace and these guys. Mm-hmm. One of those writers had dis- briefly discussed this uh, the 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 sixteen seventy two uh, Jerusalem Synod mm-hmm. and uh, bitterly complained that. The document endorses purgatory because you know when you talk to orthodox they'll say they reject purgatory then you have this sort of protestant interpretation of the synod of jerusalem saying the synod of jerusalem you know sort of tipping its hand and showing the jesuit influence upon it uh endorses purgatory now of course the word purgatory never appears in the document right but the 18th uh decree or 18th chapter or stipulation you know or mm-hmm. whatever they want to call it uh does seem to lean very close to an idea like uh, uh, like a purgatory. purgatory. So if you could, if, yeah. So, so if you could, trans, we got transubstantiation by another name and purgatory light. You know, I mean, you 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 wouldn't say that, but that's what it seems like to me. Let me read chapter eighteen from the Council of Jerusalem. So this is the Eastern Orthodox response to Cyril Lucaris. Here's what it says. Here's what it says. We believe that the souls of the dead are either in blessedness or in damnation, according as everyone has done. See, that uh, bothers me, just, even that part, because it's according to if they're in Christ or not, right? But just, I, just, I just want people to see that. For as soon as they move out of the body, they pass either to Christ or into hell. For as a man is found at his death, so is he judged. And after this life, there is neither power nor opportunity to repent. In this life, there is a time of grace. And they, therefore, who be justified here shall suffer no punishment hereafter. But they who die, being not justified, are appointed everlasting punishment. But which it is evident that the fiction of purgatory is not to be admitted, but in the truth it is determined that everyone ought to repent in this life and to obtain remission of his sins by our Lord Jesus Christ, if he will be saved. And let this be the end. Well, hold on. 
Wait, that no, you you, you, were like... reading, you you were reading Cyril's confession there. Oh wait, wait. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, man. I'm wait. Hold on. You were like the synod. The synod's getting good, huh? You start. <laughs> no. no. Oh, oh, I was. See, okay. Yeah. So I have. A, I'm having a problem here where I've got both of these up on the screen, and I'm going back and forth between uh, Cyril's confession and the uh, Eastern Orthodox response. Now I made I gotta a mistake. Say that was enjoyable though. Yeah, that yeah. was fun because you were like, "Wait a minute, this, the, yeah. the Senate is, is all right now." They, yeah. they, they, I may not like where they went in the middle part, but they ended it off well. <laughs> you know, the Senate ended on a high note. I gotta say, <laughs> so I just made a mistake, everyone. Uh, okay, and my mistake was, I thought I was reading from the response to Cyril, but I was reading Cyril's confession. That's why when I stopped, I was confused and quizzical and said, well, that sounds exactly right. What? And, but because our point leading up to it was the response sound like it flirts, sounds like it flirts with purgatory. Now I'm going to read the response by the Orthodox. By the way, again, this is why you've got to like Cyril. Uh, you you, you got to like him if you're, if you're, I mean, if you're a Roman Catholic, you might not like him. But to to if you're not Orthodox and you're not if you're not Catholic, this is why I gotta like this guy. This is epic when you're considering who he is, what he wrote. This is beautiful. Gotta love it. And now I'm gonna read the response. Shout out to Karen for the super chat, and shout out to Dino for the super chat. Is it Dino or Dino? Uh, I don't know how you would tell me either way, but. Okay, so now I'm gonna go to the actual response, which is what I said I was reading, but I'm a dummy, and so I wasn't, and so. Uh... Oh, wait, where'd it go? Where, oh, where did it respond? Oh, I must have shut it down. put a link in the live chat. No, yeah, I've got it. I got it. I just, uh, but oh, yeah, for everyone else. That's good. Okay. No, that's not it. I keep on opening up the same thing. Hold on. I've got it. I just, uh, your text, uh, let's check, fetch, pay, It's in the live chat. Interesting. <laughs> where'd it go? Well, now I... Um, uh, now you got to use the live chat. Oh, there it is. Wait. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's the very last one. Okay. Man. Okay. I got I got too many tabs going on here. Okay. So this is Decree 18. And I'm going to say something about subjective. You don't have to agree. This is subjective. And this will probably get... I feel like... I don't... It's not really just a feeling, though. I'm saying I. this is my observation... That uh, Cyril's de- Cyril's confession is uh, clear and succinct and concise, and I always know what he's saying. The Council of Jerusalem, which refutes him, I do not feel like it's concise. I definitely do not always feel like it's clear, because it seems to affirm, deny something and then affirm it right after, and it has some statements which I don't know if it's a translation but seem very murky. And what exactly are you saying here? Now, this is still helpful because it's a sense of Eastern Orthodoxy belief codified in a more explicit or detailed way, but I still find some of the murkiness and vagary of Eastern Orthodoxy in it. Now, I don't know if Abu wants to comment on that, but that's my observation. I'm going to read this. Let's see what it's to. This is from the response to Cyril, Eastern Orthodox position ostensibly. We believe that the souls of those that have fallen asleep are either at rest or in torment, according to what each has done. For when they are separated from their bodies, they depart immediately either to joy or to sorrow and lamentation, though confessedly neither their enjoyment nor condemnation are complete. For after the common resurrection, when the soul shall be united with the body, with which it had behaved itself well or ill, each shall receive the completion of either enjoyment or of condemnation." And the souls of those involved in mortal sins, who have not departed in despair, but while still living in the body, though without bringing forth any fruits of repentance, have repented by pouring forth tears, by kneeling while watching in prayers, by afflicting themselves. That's Isn't that you know, interesting? That's like, uh, uh, that's like mortification stuff, right? Yeah, that's the way I would interpret that. I haven't checked the Greek text on that. But yeah, have you ever seen the Da Vinci Code movie? Well, I've, <laughs> The White <laughs> Monk? Think- you know, he's oh, always yeah. whipping himself. Surely <laughs> history has another reference than the Da Vinci Code. I just, I just had to because it was done so extreme. You know, he has the little, the little barbed wires that he wears on his thigh. By the way, everyone, which is a real thing. The Da Vinci Code is pretty much fake. But I looked into that. The little barbed wires on the thigh, that's a real thing. Right, Abu? 
Yeah, well, I'll, I'll say this. Uh, maybe maybe some people could benefit from a little mortification of the flesh, a little, you know, beating their body low. I don't know. You know. <laughs> maybe some men, maybe some men should wear girdles made of barbed wire. It could be good for I'm them. I'm just saying. Or you I know. Mean, garters. Don't whatever. knock it till you tried it. <laughs> yeah, don't knock it till you tried it. You know, you know, the barbed wire on your thigh, at first you don't, but, you know, you gotta, yeah. You know, whipping yourself with a whip in the back. I mean, it sounds bad, but once you get into it, <laughs> I mean, it was, they got names for people like that. Okay. When you get to this part about Hades, I think this is where the, the, the parallel with Prod uh, with uh, Purgatory really comes out. But go ahead. I'm sorry. All right. All right. <laughs> so we're having too much fun with this uh, late night on the East Coast there. But uh, here's what it says. <clears throat> where, where did I go now? Where, you were at I the beginning really, of the second paragraph. You got really distracted by afflicting themselves, by relieving the poor. And finally, by showing forth by their works their love towards God and their neighbor, in which the Catholic Church has from the beginning rightly called satisfaction, their souls depart into Hades, and there endure the punishment due to the sins they have committed. But they are aware of their future release from there, and are delivered by the supreme goodness through the prayers of the priests and the good works which the relatives of each do for their departed, especially the unbloody sacrifice benefiting the most, which each offers particularly for his relatives that have fallen asleep, and which the Catholic and Apostolic offers daily for all alike. Bro, that is purgatory, man! Well, that's what I was going to say. So again, to, to recap why this is, this is significant is because you'll meet quite a few Orthodox who say, you know, that they reject purgatory. And it's not clear what precisely they reject. Uh, and then you have these certain Protestants who are familiar with the subject of the Synod. Uh, it might be Philip Schaff, I'm not sure, but who, you know, in the 19th century were writing that the Synod of, of, of uh, Jerusalem uh, affirmed purgatory, you know, under Jesuit influence. And uh, but the word purgatory purgatory doesn't appear. But then when you look at this 18th uh, uh, decree, it does seem to parallel purgatory closely. You know? Yeah, bro. Check this out. Check this out. Let's break this down to everybody. Okay. Uh, we we really gotta we really gotta say this. We well, let's break this down because th this is kind of a bombshell to me. Their souls depart into Hades. But listen to how they define it and they're endure the punishment due to the sins they have committed so they're paying for their sins by the way again uh the idea that a soul who is not in christ could actually pay in a satisfactory way for their sin to me that idea is anathema in of self but let's look at this they are aware of their future release from there so this is saying they're going to get out of hades and they know it they are essentially delivered. saved persons per, or persons who will be saved yeah persons who will be saved and are delivered by the supreme goodness listen how they're delivered though everybody through the prayers of priests so literally praying for the dead and the good works which the relatives of each do for their departed can you explain to me a good work that you could do for the departed what's the official way that could happen within eastern orthodoxy do you know Oh, I, I wouldn't know. But I, I imagine just prayers in itself or maybe I well, don't <laughs> Do they have something equivalent to indulgences or or I'm sorry, not indulgences, but. um. Oh, shoot. What, you know what Tetzel was selling all the time? I, I think they would say surely not. I think our, our Orthodox friends would say surely not. But nonetheless, certainly but, uh, one thing I've, I've heard from Orthodox is this is, again, where. You know, maybe Rome takes it too far in trying to be too, too specific, you know, because I think I've seen Orthodox balk at this idea that you see in medieval Catholicism where you're, and even some modern Catholics, where you're putting precise time frames on it, you know, do this action and you, you take uh, X amount of time, you know, you take this many years off of your time there or something like that. So uh, I think they would shy away from the idea of indulgences because it might get a little too close to that. This is where we're yeah, yeah, you know, uh, and, far and too the, specific. And, in the Luther movie, they had like um, Tetzel was like five hundred years less. <laughs> you know? He'll knock off fifty years, man. Now, hey, Abu, honestly, what I've seen, uh, and you know, there's always something to learn. The older Roman Catholics who would talk about purgatory would talk about it like it was a long time, and they would give years to it. And I seem it seems like more modern Roman Catholic theologians, from what I've seen, talk about it like maybe it's like a blink, like you don't even kind of realize you're there and it's over type of thing. I don't know if you've seen that uh, difference there. 
I, I've seen, uh, yeah, or, or discussion on how it's not a place but a state or something like that and uh, how the fire that burns you is the fire of shame. And I've, I've seen all kinds of stuff like that. But I don't know. Right. Uh, but those, those medieval uh, mortality plays, I mean, they would have like straight up fire and people were like, God, ah, can you hear the screams? Can you hear them? <laughs> you know? It's interesting, though. It's interesting because, well, for example, uh, regarding uh, Hades – now, the, the, the Synod document uh, explicitly affirms, like, for example, the, the Deuterocanon, the, what, what you know, Apoc uh, Protestants call the Apocrypha, uh, they explicitly affirm it as scripture, so that would include Sirach, and Sirach describes uh, Hades as a place of fiery torment. Uh, it could be argued that Luke does as well, but then some would say, well, no, that's just a, a parable when Luke 16 does it. But nonetheless, uh, Sirach is unambiguous. It's in the 51st chapter of Sirach. It's unambiguous in describing uh, Hades as a place of a fiery torment. So when you put that together with this, you do essentially have uh, people in this temporary holding cell, people who ultimately will be saved, uh, going through a process of, uh, you know, essentially, because I think ultimately the Orthodox will say they're not being saved by their punishment, it's more of something, a cleansing fire, you know, if right. anything, or a cleansing punishment, you know, and then in that sense, there is a, an element of purgation going on here. And I've heard the uh, guys from Catholic Answers argue from that, and they use a passage in Corinthians. Now, mm. uh, I'm going to get, I see Scythe and Jay Norm with some super chats. We're going to get to those. Just let us finish this part of purgatory. I'm going to get to your comments, okay, guys? I'm not going to ignore those, okay? So the good works with, with the relatives of each do for their departed. So the idea is you can do a good work that in, it's, it's like enables an earlier release for a relative who's caught in purgatory. Especially the unbloody sacrifice benefiting the most. They're talking about their, version, their understanding of the Mass. That's what, mean, that's what they mean by unbloody sacrifice. Mm -hmm. They're saying especially taking Mass. That's the most helpful thing of all for people in this place that they're calling Hades that sounds like purgatory. And so are they saying there, Abu, that uh, a person who's alive, who's a relative, could take mass on behalf of someone who's in Hades? Is that what they're saying? That seems to be what they're saying, yeah, in how some would sense. You, yeah. How would you do that? How would you, like, um, differentiate that this mass is not for me, but it's for someone else? How, how does that work? Do you know? Oh, I don't You would have to discuss that with, uh, with your Orthodox friends, your many new Orthodox friends. <laughs> yeah. Well, is that something <laughs> you can do in uh, Roman Catholicism? Yeah, well, it's certainly part of the history of the Catholic Church. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if I can speak on the precise mechanics of it. How would they – no, but like how – what would they say? Like how how is it determined this – like for example, I'm not trying to be funny. Like Mormons baptize for the dead, and they'll say the person's name that they're getting baptized for, right? They, this this is a real thing because there's a famous lady who who bapt, was baptized for the dead. She got baptized for Hitler, and it was kind of a scandal – when people uh, realize that the Mormon Church had done baptism for the dead for Adolf Hitler, right? And so you you say the person's name, and that's why the Mormons are big on genealogies. That's one reason. You actually so it's it's clear this is for them. It's called uh, proxy baptism. Sometimes I'll refer to that as baptism by proxy, right? I'm doing this so they have a chance to hear the gospel essentially in their current state, right? So it's it's uh, it's known what's happening. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Is there any version you're aware of within the history? Yeah, of, I mean, vaguely, well, uh, that you can, I guess, hold the mass for someone who's, who's departed, you know, who would have that explicit. How, though? Who would, who, would, who, would, who would get to decide that? Like, how would you make that happen, though? I'm, I'm oh, really I don't confused. Know. I, don't, I guess you have to discuss it with the priest who's conducting the mass. So you, so you can say, we're going to do this, but would everybody attend? Everyone's going to come to a mass, but it's on someone else's behalf, so everyone who partakes helps them? I'm trying to figure it out. <laughs> I don't know the me I couldn't possibly tell you the mechanics. Okay, of that. okay. I'm just to what extent that the participants are, are helping in that. Because uh, they're saying the unbloody sacrifice helps them the most, but I just don't. And here, here's what they say after that, which each offers particularly for his relatives to fall asleep. See, it seems like they're saying this is for them. You know, it's kind of like when you got someone in lockdown and you can put uh, money on their account so they can go to the commissary or whatever and get some stuff. You know, uh, it's like it's designated for that purpose. They're they're doing this here, but I don't understand how anyways in which the catholic and apostolic offers daily for all alike of course it is understood that we do not know the time of their release we know and believe that there is deliverance for such from their direful condition so it's unpleasant but it's not hell and that the common resurrection and judgment but when we know not that's not, i mean 
if I read that to a Catholic, even like a, a higher up, and they didn't know what it was from, it seems like they would say that sounds like a medieval affirmation of 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 purgatory, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess they would consider this the modern era because it's sixteen hundreds. Sometimes they say the medieval era ends sometime in fifteen hundreds or something like that. But anyways, you get the idea. So uh, fascinating uh, here. Fascinating. Let's look at these comments from the live chat. Unless you have something else to say, Abu. No, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. We call this era the captivity of orthodoxy, and where some of our clergy were educated by Rome and others by Protestants. So that's Jay Norm's comment. He's saying uh. that the time we're talking about, Orthodox call this time the captivity of Orthodoxy. Do you know about this but, term or this concept? Well, I mean, I, I don't know, not about the precise term, but certainly the idea that some were under the influence of the Protestants and others were the, under the influence of Rome. But I would ask if in this case he's saying that even the Synod or even uh, Docetheos are in error, you know, are they too Roman? And if so, on what grounds, you know? Oh, yeah, like, yeah, is, yeah, there, yeah. is there something else that overrules uh, either the Synod of Jerusalem or the Confession of Docetheos? Right, because if, if he's saying it in regards to uh, Cyril's confession, obviously we would say, okay, uh, but since he said educated by Rome, well, that wouldn't apply to him. But this could apply to them. But is it better to call this a synod than a council, Abu? I noticed yeah, I wouldn't know the synod. difference, but yeah, sure. It's certainly not an ecumenical council. That's the distinction. I'm not sure where a lesser council and, and synod dis, uh, diverge. They might be synonymous. Okay. Man, so... Oh, uh, that does. I mean, that that you're. It sounds just like it, right? How does it not sound like? I mean, we've got transstation and purgatory, but hey, Jay Norman, any anything else you want to say to that? I'll I'll try to look for your comment. I appreciate the super chat. Yeah, listen, time. I would just be curious if he because I I might be missing the the timing of that, but I'm wondering if that right. was in response to the section on this apparent parallel with purgatory. Like, was he saying the 18th decree of the uh, mm -hmm. synod? Was mistaken. He said praying for the dead is not purgatory. Well, agree. Although, been, although it, it, it begins to, you know, proponents of purgatory see, you know, a, a lean in that direction. I think where it starts to look like purgatory is this idea that someone could go to Hades, suffer in Hades, and, you know, people can, uh, you know, do these sorts of acts of charity that lessen their suffering there. And it's a temporary suffering for a person who is ultimately going to be saved. Yeah, but that's that the thing. That makes it sound a lot like purgatory. Because I'm the one who said said that, but I, I didn't say literally pray for the dead. For, but like, it's because we're reading in Decree 18, the context is sort of the personal eschatology, you know, what happens to this person after da-da-da. And here's describing this this state in this place called Hades. And, you're, and then it's saying that one thing that's happened is they're being prayed for by relatives of my priests. And uh, it's the context. What is the context of it? That's all, that's all we're talking about. I think it was similar to what you're saying, the context there. Uh, Scythe says this. If I do recall, Luther and the Eastern Church were in contact with each other and agreed on things pertaining to the Scripture. I'm sure they had lots in common, but I think the just as I'm sure Luther had lots in common with Rome, I think the question is the points of disagreement. Yeah, well, they would have. I don't. So I don't. I don't think they would have agreed on the canon, and I don't think they would have agreed on sola scriptura. Well, here's the thing about the canon. I want to mention this because you you said you've recently been reading uh, Callistos Weir's book, his his short book on the Orthodox Church. If I'm not mistaken, he says that, for example, the Deuterocanon is of a lesser status. You know, what, what's popularly called the the apocrypha in Protestant circles is of a, a lesser status. He says that in that book, but the the synod. If I understand, you know, it's a, it's one of the questions, the third question or second question. Uh, it seems pretty clear that they're, you know, that, that this is false scripture. At least that's the way I understand it. Hmm. So, so I, I think there is this sort of question, you know, because the question of the 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 uh, status of the relevant books obviously predates the Reformation. So it makes sense that there would be differences of opinion within both Catholic history and Orthodox history. Jane Norm brings up, he says, uh, we don't believe in purgatory. Uh, right, Jane we were Norm, saying that that's the standard position of the Orthodox, but then the question becomes, yeah. that, that's precisely why we introduced this 18th uh, decree, because 
you have a situation where just about any, almost any uh, Orthodox you'll speak to will tell you that the, the Orthodox Church does not believe in purgatory. And then you also, then suddenly you have these, uh, at least what I've come across, these 19th century Protestants insisting that the Synod of Jerusalem actually affirm purgatory. And that's why it's interesting to look at that 18th decree to see uh, who's right, because obviously those two statements can't be both be right. And at the very least, what's described in that 18th decree does seem to really parallel purgatory. And I would ask, what is the difference? Like, I'm, I'm uncertain, honestly, what would be the difference Abu, between that and purgatory? It sounds like what you're saying is this is one of those times the Protestants were actually right. About what? I'm sorry, you lost me. Because you said the 18th century... Uh, oh yes, 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 yeah. <laughs> You're saying that it's, or 19th century, 19th century sorry, writers, yeah, yeah. like the Philip Schaff or something like that. Yeah, yeah. it sounds like I mean, it's one of the times you're saying they're right. Yeah, yeah, every now and then, you know. So, Jay Norm, we know that uh, your average modern EOC person says we don't believe in purgatory. That's what we're saying because then you have some 19th century folks like Philip Schaff you mentioned. Uh, saying, hey, look at the East Affirm Purgatory over here. And maybe that's where Jay Norman is saying that's they're under the influence of Catholicism. But this is a, a synod at Jerusalem. This is not a small deal. You know, this is not a small deal. And it's saying we believe. And it, then what is this describing? You know, or is it just an outright it denial? And was there a later denial to correct this? Which is what something Abu mentioned. Like, what, what do we hold? What were you going to say, Abu? You mentioned something. You no, know? just that. Like, and I don't, I don't mean this as a challenge. I'm not putting this question out as a challenge. I'm sincerely curious. Uh, for, for those who would take that position, what is the difference between that 18th decree and purgatory? Right. A shout out to Lazarus. Come forth. You bring up a good point. Uh, I affirm with what you're saying there. Read uh, that on the screen there in regards to the supper, the Lord's Supper. Um, Carm. Oh, my goodness. Your super chat. You're killing the game out here, Carm. She is one of the mods, and she is the bomb, and she says, vocab, your mods appreciate you. Thank you so much. Carm, are you doing this because we're going to have a celebration sometime this weekend for the three-year anniversary of Street Apologists, and it seems like you're getting on, on board early. So just real quick, since Carm just did this, which I really appreciate. Over the weekend, I haven't got the day worked out. We're going to do our three-year anniversary. And our three-year anniversary is going to be uh, just kind of stupid, kind of crazy. Because what I'm going to do is uh, go live and give everyone the link. <laughs> and then anybody can come in the room and talk to me about what they hate or love about Street Apologies Live. <laughs> and then it's just going to be this like <laughs> stupid free-for-all. And then if you're an idiot, I'll just kick you out. And then if you're cool, I might talk to you for a while. <laughs> so that's the way we're going to celebrate our three-year anniversary. <laughs> so uh, look look forward to that. So let me see here. I am glad that some EOC folks have been joining us. I appreciate that. And I think that that is – Very uh, much appreciated. Their presence yeah. is appreciated. Their real presence is appreciated, right? <laughs> Their participation in this was yeah. appreciated. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jay Norm says, I'm saying that in regards to both. So I hear you, Jay Norm. But what we want to know is, where was this contradicted later on? Who, Because who, how is this, how can you just say it's just not right, right? He say, I pray for the dead is actually an ancient Christian practice. We can see it in the second Absolutely. century. And, and also an ancient Jewish practice. It, it certainly goes all the way back to antiquity. Uh, it's... I think yeah, the, yeah, it the, goes the all the way back to the it goes all the way back to the pagans. Yeah, you're right. Okay, <laughs> but putting that controversy aside, I think I don't think either of us are saying prayers for the dead by themselves automatically entail purgatory. No, I think the, the yeah, question that's, is right. We were not what saying is that. The difference between what's described in this 18th decree yes. of the Synod of Jerusalem and the doctrine of purgatory. That's number one. And I, again, I want to make clear, I'm not trying to challenge my orthodox friends here i'm simply sincerely asking this question uh it, what would the difference be between the doctrine of purgatory where does purgatory go wrong if that 18th decree i'm is trying correct? to challenge them to, you gotta and then, show us okay you are but i'm not and then yeah, and, and then the second question would be if it's if it's an error uh on what grounds would someone say that the 18th uh, decree of the senate of jerusalem is an error like is there something above it which has corrected it or is this you know, I think that's a, a legitimate question, and I'm sincerely curious. Exact facts. He says the Synod of Jerusalem was obviously Roman Catholic influenced, just like Cyril was Reformed Protestant influenced. 
Uh, okay, it's, here's the thing, uh, though. Here's the thing. They're not saying it's influenced by Roman Catholicism. They're saying this is what the Orthodox Church believes and holds to. And if it's influenced by s- some foreign force, some toxic substance from, out, you know, some alien ideology. Which tricked it into taking positions outside of orthodoxy. Yeah, that's like, yo, dude, this is a sin of Jerusalem. You're telling me that's what happened there? Well, no, the question I would ask is if that happened, is there, like, what source do we go to for the correction of the Synod of Jerusalem? And also, I'd like to see some evidence that that was what was happening. Maybe it was what's happening, but I, I feel skeptical about just saying, well, that's what happened. With, with the case with um, Cyril, we got some private correspondence that shows us some inner thoughts of the man, right? Uh, I want to know some, some about this because it seems like he's willing to just reject it. Like that, and I appreciate his comments. So we're just going back and forth. But uh, you know, Boo's saying something. I'm saying something a little different. But J Norm, in all seriousness, and maybe there is. So I don't claim to know everything. Where's the corrective from a, kind of an official or quasi official or something like that EOC framework? Where's the corrective to this? Doesn't shouldn't this have been corrected if it's that far off? And so should the transubstantiation part. Even though it says they're not saying chance association, I'm just saying. Nonetheless, here's another uh, D Proverbs with a super chat. Says, Vocab and Abu, did you guys see the video review Sam Shamoon and William did today on James White and Dr. Michael Brown and Purgatory? Uh, no, I have not, but I not, I didn't know it, it happened, but I, I look forward to seeing it. I've really been enjoying some of uh, – well, I, I love Sam. Let me just say that. I, I adore Sam Shamoon. But on top of that, aside from my general – admiration for sam i've enjoyed some of his more recent videos on subjects like the uh, perpetual virginity of mary etc so no i'm looking forward to seeing that but i'm sorry i did not see it yet before hmm. reading the comment i didn't even know the show happened hmm. but now you're excited about it i am a little bit more excited than vocab is uh... <laughs> <laughs> yes you may be speaking truth there brother hey, you, says yeah. if you look at the actual history you will see a Reformed Protestant faction and a Roman Catholic influence faction. The Roman Catholic influence faction murdered Patriarch Cyril. I'm glad you uh, brought this that up. To another thing. <laughs> yes, I'm actually. Hey, no. So uh, yeah, first I'm glad of all, you brought that up. first of all, we can tell Jay Norm, you know, that you've looked at this stuff. Okay, so uh, Jay Norm has looked into this, and uh, I appreciate that. So Jay Norm, thank you for your quotes, your comments, and the fact that you've looked into this stuff. Thank you. We really appreciate your. Your perspective. And that's why I'm putting your comments on the screen. Um, but that is probably a good way to kind of end this out. What happened at the end? Because check this out. If he's really like a Calvinist leaning patriarch of Constantinople, you think they're going to let him stay in his position? Not so much. In fact, it gets kind of intrigued up in here. Can you please tell us, Abu, what happened? Well, I won't. I won't endorse fully the idea that it was that Catholics killed him. Although some have said that they had an influence, and what happened was apparently, my understanding is that the Sultan was uh, he was headed off to war somewhere in West Asia, and he was alarmed by rumors that this Protestant leaning patriarch was too close to Western European authorities. Right. So, you know, quick, let Western me, European let me, powers. Let me let me say. Uh, the, I try to break things down. What he just said is exactly right. So. The Muslim sultan, the ruler of the area, he was headed off for war. Imagine that. Surprise, right? So he's going to go off to fight. And he's like, hey, well, I got this, you know, Christian guy, leader I let live in my jurisdiction as long as he ain't converting people. But, uh, you know, uh, I'm here he's like kind of down with the West now. You know, he's throwing up the dub and everything, you know. Uh, that's concerning because. Throwing I'm up like, the solas. Say what? Throwing up the five solas. Or yeah, something. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm kind of concerned about that because I don't want this homeboy to be down with the West. That's that's that could create some political problems from the theology, right? Okay, help me out. Well, go, yeah, go, yeah, go. political in, in particular. That's my understanding that he was worried not so much about his theology, but about his connections to the West and you know and, and Western powers, and therefore it's sort of like this, uh, you know, why take a chance? And so. My understanding is that he was pushed into exile. He had been exiled before. He had been deposed before and then re- mm-hmm. re-elected. And, uh, but during this last uh, you know, trip into exile, he was on a boat 
and uh, some Turkish janissaries uh, strangled him and threw his body into the into the water. You know, and now I I do not affirm uh, I, I don't endorse the claim that it was Catholics that killed him. It's apparently you know uh, the, the Muslim authorities that killed him, but uh, it does it is plausible that it may have been you know that some say that you know Catholics who disliked him sort of helped foment these rumors about how dangerous he might be to the to the sultan you know that seems plausible i don't think it was a catholic who choked him but whether or not catholics might have been you know helping along this idea that you can't trust this guy because he's too close to you know germany or something like that so yeah he's on the way to somewhere else i mean it literally sounds like a scene out of the sopranos you know hey come out on the boat here you know you're coming on the boat and next thing you know cyril cyril sleeps with the fishes you know that's that's what happens. So, your theory is a little different, and it's just speculation, but it's interesting. You were saying it was most likely uh, essentially Turkish troops, but they may have even been from a Christian background, perhaps. Yeah, Janissaries. A lot of the Janissaries were, you know, from Christian families. They themselves were Muslims, but they were, you know, conscripted as young boys and. And uh, converted to Islam and, and raised as, as like elite troops. Because when the Islam. Muslims come come in, they would uh, they would see a Christian family and say, "Hey, I noticed you got a son here." And then what happened? And, and when, you know, and we'd like to you know give him a great education and um, some military training and you know an improvement on his faith. Uh, and, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and honestly, and uh, we won't take aside, no for an that, answer. We won't take no for an answer, right? Yeah, and and all jokes aside, I think that's one of those many. Um, little uh incentives to convert to islam you know you the, the the government won't snatch your sons from you there's you know it, there's no chance of that happening if you were muslim you know even that's an incentive to, to at least make mm-hmm. conversion uh, but whatever know, the case yeah so the janissaries yeah they may have been yeah so it, it's it's interesting it may have even been uh, the person who, who actually murdered him may have been from a christian family you know in the east An orthodox had christian the, deal. Family. the east the the christians of the east uh, whether they're eastern orthodox or not have had to deal with, um, you know, the problem of living under Sharia a lot more than Christians in other parts of the world, you know, and so uh, the, it's it's no joke, and there's a lot of factors there to consider. Uh, we're winding down. Jane Norm says this though: Patriarch Cyril wasn't the only one influenced by the Reformed. Also, the Greek Orthodox still like Patriarch Cyril because he fought against the Roman Catholic influenced faction. Do you know who other folks are? If they, if they, anyone with a name, there was that we could point to who was influenced by the reformers. Not that I, not that I can uh, name. No, uh, I mean maybe Jane Norm can. What I wanted to say though is, is I wouldn't regarding Roman Catholic influence on this document, right? I wouldn't rule that out. Like I'm, I'm sympathetic to this idea that as the Orthodox leaned away from you know Cyril's overreach, they wound up you know. Uh, locking arms on points of common agreement with, you know, Jesuit thinkers or something like that. I'm sympathetic to that suggestion. But what I don't, uh, what, I, what I'm not ready to get on board with is the idea that the positions that the Synod took are necessarily uh, erroneous within orthodoxy. That's going to be the question. On what grounds is the 18th degree of the Synod in error? In, on what grounds is the 18th degree of the Synod unorthodox? Is I think, and I don't, and again, I want to say I'm not putting that out as a challenge. That's a, a question that I would have sincerely, whether oh, I was no. orthodox or not. Shout out to Brother JP for the super chat as well. Thank you very much, my man. All right, what do you think of doing this thing last? We could we could end, or I could read this little section from Timothy Ware's book, his account of this. Oh, please do. Yeah, I would All definitely, right. yeah. We'll do so, that. So, so story that time with uh, Grandpa uh, Vocab here. Yes, yes. <clears throat> <clears throat> one of the best representatives, <clears throat> sorry, one of the representatives of the Patriarchate of Constantinople at Brest in 1596 was a young Greek priest called Cyril Lucaris, 1572 to 1638. Whether as a result of his experiences in Ukraine or because of friendships that he subsequently made in Constantinople, he showed in later life a strong hostility towards the Church of Rome. On becoming ecumenical patriarch, he devoted his full energies to combating Roman Catholic influence in the Turkish Empire. 
It was unfortunate, though, perhaps inevitable, that in his struggle against the papic church, as the Greeks termed it, he should have become deeply involved in politics. He turned naturally for help to the Protestant embassies at Constantinople, while his Jesuit opponents, for their part, used the diplomatic representatives of the Roman Catholic powers. Besides invoking the political assistance of Protestant diplomats, Sewer also fell under Protestant influence in matters of theology. And his confession, first published at Geneva in 1629, is distinctively Calvinist in much of its teaching. Cyril's reign as patriarch is one long series of stormy intrigues and forms a lurid example, a lurid example of the troubled state of the ecumenical patriarch at patriarchate at the time under the Ottomans. <clears throat> six times deposed from office and six times reinstated, he was finally strangled by Turkish Janissaries. How do you say that word again? Janissaries? I, I mean, I could be pronouncing it wrong. I say Janissaries, you know. Janissaries? Turkish uh, is something like Janissaries? Janissaries or something okay. like that. And his body cast into the Bosphorus. In the last resort, there is something deeply tragic about his career. Since he was possibly the most brilliant man to have held office as patriarch since the days of St. Photius, had he but lived under happier conditions, freed from political intrigue, his exceptional gifts might have been put to better use. Cyril's Calvinism was sharply and speedily repudiated by his fellow Orthodox, his confession being condemned by no less than six local councils between 1638 and 1691. We should read some of those others sometimes. In direct reaction to Cyril, two other Orthodox hierarchs, Peter of Mahagelia and Dosieth on Jerusalem, produced confessions of their own. Peter's Orthodox confession, written in 1640, was based directly on Roman Catholic manuals. It was approved by the Council of Jassy in Romania, 1642, but only after it had been revised by a Greek, Militia Sirios, who in particular altered the passages about the consecration and the Eucharist, which Peter attributed solely to the words of the institution and about purgatory. Even its revised form, the Confession of Moghelia, is still the most Latin document ever to be adopted by an official council of the Orthodox Church. So perhaps there is some of the other uh, examples Jane Orr might give in regards mm, to mm, the East. Agreed, that's Apple. precisely what we, I was thinking. Yeah, because we weren't even talking about that one. Look what he's saying here. Josithius, Patriarch of Jerusalem from 1669 to 1707, likewise drew heavily upon Latin sources. His confession, ratified in 1672 by the Council of Jerusalem, also known as the Council of Bethlehem, and that's the one we've been talking about, answers Cyril's confession point by point with concision and clarity. The chief matters over which Cyril and Dosius diverge are four. The question of free will, grace, and predestination. The doctrine of the church, the number and nature of the sacraments, and the veneration of icons. In his statement upon the Eucharist, Dosius adopted not only the Latin term transubstantiation, but the scholastic distinction between substance and accidents, and in defending prayers for the dead, he, and in defending prayers for the dead, he came very close to the Roman doctrine of purgatory, without actually using the word purgatory itself. I mean, so he's I hadn't read this section yet. I just knew it was here. He's affirming what we've been saying. On the whole, however, the confession of Dosius is less Latin than of than that of Magalia, and must certainly be regarded as a document of primary importance in the history of 17th century Orthodox theology. Faced by the Calvinism of Lucaris, Dositheus used the weapons which lay nearest to hand. Latin weapons, under the circumstances, it was perhaps the only thing that he could do. But the faith which he defended with these Latin weapons was not Roman, but Orthodox. And that is the end of that section. Wow. Fascinating. Can you jump to page uh, 200 and just read the section on the Deuterocanon? Yeah. Because it, it, it also, uh, if I recall correctly, it, it gets into the... Uh... By the way, real quick, he brings up the fact that uh, Cyril Lucas had corresponded with the Archbishop of Canterbury. Interesting. Interesting, yeah. interesting. I did not know that. Yeah, yeah. interesting. And Callisto Squared himself is British, right? Wasn't he? I, I know he's he's an Orthodox bishop, but if I'm not mistaken, he was a former Anglican. I could be wrong about that. I think that's correct. Where'd you say to go, bro? Page two hundred, where it talks about the Deuterocanon. I'm looking at uh, my notes. I don't have the book in front of me, but I, if yeah, I recall yeah. correctly, okay. what about it? Uh, if you could just read the section on the Apocrypha, because I think it you sort of see this um, a very slight tension between what some Orthodox say and what the um, the, uh, the the this particular synod said. Okay, I think you mean right here. 
The Hebrew yeah, like version the, of the Old Testament contains 39 books. The Septuagint contains, in addition, 10 further books not present in the Hebrew, which are known in the Orthodox Church as the Deuterocanonical books. These were declared by the Council of Jassy, 1642, and Jerusalem, 1672, to be genuine parts of Scripture. Most Orthodox scholars of the present day, however, following the opinion of Athanasius and Jerome, consider that the Deuterocanonical books, although part of the Bible, stand on a lower footing than the rest of the Old Testament. Yeah, it's that however, which I find interesting. It's It's... It's uh, it's almost as though he senses a, uh, a a divergence of opinion from the position that was taken by the Synod in 1672, as well as the Council in 1642. If I, I think it was 1642. Is that what it said? Uh, Yassi? Whatever, yes. whatever the case. Whatever the case. Yes. Yeah. yes. I, I just thought that was interesting. The, no, it is. Okay. Now, uh, the, I wish we could do more here, but we yeah. got to end. I want to give a shout out to everyone. In, in the, the future, least. you can do more, especially with your, your many newly acquired Orthodox friends. I think they can have a much more interesting conversation with you. Louisa Capel says Orthodoxy is not Roman Catholicism. They are quite different. Yes, Agreed. Louisa, we agree, and we know that. And what we were saying tonight is, yes, that's true. And yet what's fascinating is some of these quasi-official documents put out by the East during the time around the Reformation – sound way more Roman Catholic uh, than a lot of modern day uh, East folks would say and, and that people would say is really part of the Orthodox tradition and really uh, a really prominent, uh, well-known uh, Timothy or Callistus Ware, I think is how you say it. Uh, uh, you know, that book is kind of known by everybody who looks into this, uh, essentially says the same thing. He uses the word Latin. That's what he says, though. You know, Sam. So fascinating. Uh, I'm going to cover this again, probably without Abu, so the I can really be no holds barred there. You know? <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> hey, Jane Norm says, I was wrong about who murdered Cyril. I was going off pure memory. Well, t t in, your defense, in your defense, in your defense, Jane Norm, though, there, well, did, who did he say did it? Jesuits? The, the Catholics. He said Catholics in general. Yeah. And that is in print. There are people making that claim in print. Yes, yes. So you know, uh, Jay Norm, there are people who do claim that. Some will get specific and say Jesuits or something like that. Uh, but there are people who say it was Catholics. Some will say Catholics kind of put them in the position for that to happen, which I think Abu brought up. Mm -hmm. But some are more explicit. I've heard people say that the Catholics ultimately were responsible for doing this. It seems like I think I've heard people from the East say it, not Protestants, because more people from the East are the ones who talk about this if anyone talks about it. You can, you know, I'm saying there's not a lot out there on this, which is there should be. By the way, so, can I say one point of clarification yeah. just in case there was uh, any confusion? Uh, you, so you read from page 97 where it talks about this, this sort of later correction to the texts, uh, you know, the references to the allusions to purgatory. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm not mistaken, just so we're clear on that, it wasn't the synod that was being corrected. It was this uh, 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 confession of uh, Peter of uh, of uh, or, or uh, of Mogila, right, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. Yeah, yeah Peter they're, of they're saying that one. His uh, he, where says that one's even more Latin sounding. Mm -hmm. Which that makes me want to read it. I want to see what's in there. Well, uh, we'll yeah. try to cover this again. Check this out. I got a couple things going on this weekend, so I'm not sure when each show is going to happen. Let me tell you what they are real quick. Um, plan on doing a program with Jesus is the Word. He recently uh, visited Sakari. And so every weekend we do a Sakari Sunday review. But sometimes we got to move it around, and we may need to move it to Friday perhaps. So that would be tomorrow. And so I may do this conversation with Jesus the Word that's Sakari Weekend Review, in which what we do there is talk about um, his encounter with them because they said some very interesting stuff, such as Judas is one of the elect, basically. Uh, and so we want to look at this and see what's going on with that. And so then also we've got um, the three-year celebration that Street Apologies Live has been around three years, and that probably will happen on Saturday is what I'm looking for towards the evening there. And I'm just still working on a couple of things, and then maybe Sunday night, maybe do another show on Eastern Orthodoxy uh, by my solo self. And then after that, there's going to be a little vacation, so you might not see me live for a while, but we'll see. We'll see. So, Abu, final words, and shout out to David Monreal. How you doing, brother? Uh, Abu, you got any final, final words there, bro? No, just that uh, this was a fun topic. I think it's an interesting topic. We really only scratched the surface. I, I honestly think a, a person could devote years of their life to going through the nuances of for example, that, that synod document. And, and also, I want to say I appreciate all the Orthodox who came on to 
to help with this conversation. You know, certainly no ill will was intended. You know, yeah, I, Catholics I really love it when Orthodox. It. Catholics love it when Orthodox correct them. You know, this Catholic does. I adore the Orthodox. I, I adore them. You know, they are special flowers, and I, I don't mean that sarcastically. They're, they're real gems in this world. <laughs> and you are all right too. <laughs> Dang I'm young sorry. Protestant upstart. You, uh, you got you think you can. <laughs> All right, yeah. Hey, man, uh, appreciate uh, your time, brother. You always do great on these. And here's what I'm going to do I'm going to play the outro, then I'll come back and do a freestyle. And then later on, I'm going to cut out that freestyle. So here's the outro. And then stick around after the outro if you want to hear a freestyle or two. All right, with that, peace out. God bless. And shalom.